Hey guys, welcome back to another painting video. I'm JR, and I hope you're all doing well today. Today's video is the fourth and final part of our digital painting series of Rosa Vendcast, an original character we've been working on here. I'm not gonna lie to all of you, I'm excited to continue where we left off last time, because all the dominoes were starting to really line up on this project. And for those of you who have been watching along since the very beginning, first off, let me say thank you for having stuck with this painting process that long. I know this has been a long project. But we're in the home stretch now, and everything that was unfinished in previous parts, we will be wrapping up today. That means that unfinished details like her face and the bow and her hair, all things that I'm really excited to dive into, we will be doing so here in this video. Now, wrapping up a painting like this is going to be an elaborate process, I won't lie to you. But I'm going to do my best to explain it in a way that's understandable and digestible to follow along. Whether you're a beginner or an experienced artist, my goal is that you come away from this video having learned something new. But by all means, if at any point during this process you lose track of what I'm doing or need more explanation of some technique that I'm using. Feel free to ask any questions you might have down in the comments. And I'll be more than happy to elaborate on any aspect you might need help with. Just like in the previous parts of this painting series, today we will be painting in Clip Studio Paint, and I will be using my Wacom Cintiq 22 HD. So without any further ado, let me grab my paintbrush here and toss it to the side. What am I thinking? Because today is a digital painting and it would not be best to get paint on my screen. Call me paranoid, but I think that would void the warranty. Last time we had wrapped things up just having finished the background. And so, best to pick things up, I think, with background character separation. Because right now, if we zoom out, she has like no separation from the background. It's a whole bunch of noise, and sharp colors, and I think the best place to start with this is to add a soft blur to that background. And then we're going to use some blending modes like Multiply to focus on separating her contrast from the scene. So areas where her luminosity is on the brighter side, I'll darken up the background a little bit in broad strokes using this Multiply layer. And in areas of the foreground that are on the darker side, like the bow, we'll actually come in here with just a normal layer and just paint in a little bit of brighter colored atmospheric haze, both brightening up the background and adding a little bit of character to the lighting in the scene as well. And we can see with just a few small tweaks how big of an impact that made. I should mention that the adjustments I just made to the background we're not in the effort of perfecting the lighting just yet. My only goal there was to add just enough separation so that we can continue to paint and finish up Rosa without the background being distracting, getting it into a state that balances decently with her, but we will be coming back to it to further perfect that lighting once our character is in a more perfected state herself. That way we can actually balance the background to our finished character rather than the current state the character is in. But speaking of character refinement, the lighting on the legs does need a little work here. I think what it needs is just the incorporation of a few more shadows from the upper leg. I just need to make sure that I'm constantly referencing and sampling the colors and everything from our upper leg so that the style and the feel of the leg that we're kind of just painting in now still fits. But really, this is what the final parts of a painting process is for me. Just me zooming out, taking a look at the painting in its current state, and getting an idea and trying to spot small elements that don't quite line up or aren't quite finished, and then going in to touch them up. And this back leg right here, it still needs a little bit more details. It's a little lacking in that department. So we'll add in a little bit of a seam. It's just a matter of being able to 
take in the information of your painting and spotting where things don't quite measure up to your standards and knowing how to go in there and fix it. I find that for me, six times out of 10, it's the lighting that needs a little bit of work. And, you know, three times out of 10, it will be just a little bit more details that we need to be added, like the seams and stuff. And then the like one time out of 10, I guess, it would be proportion touch-ups, usually resulting in needing a little bit of a liquify tool added in. So I would highly recommend during a touch-up phase, zooming out and looking at your artwork from a distance. It is a big part of finding where you've gone wrong or where you haven't finished up parts of the painting yet. Flipping your canvas is also a really good idea and can be massively helpful in spotting those errors. Okay, I'm really liking how the extra details that we've added to the extra details and lighting that we've added to the pants and the midriff are turning out. One additional thing that I want to show all of you, if we make a new layer and then clipping mask it, and let's change it to overlay. I think that would be a good choice. Let's go to airbrush. And right now, our background lighting has the lighting coming in with yellow and the shadows being a very turquoisey blue-green. So with this overlay layer, let's go ahead and add just a, a hint of that to our colors here. I chose overlay because it's a good one to use when you want to adjust the lighting color without affecting how bright something is too much. For instance, color dodge would end up blowing out all of the lighting. But now, just that, even without adding the shadows, that matches our scene just a, a tad more than that. Also helps to make her pop off the background by adding a little bit more uh, color. But I do want to make sure that we are hewing the right direction. So before we get too far into it, let's add a hue and saturation and adjust the hue a little bit in either direction. Double check that we're really where we want to be. We also can't forget that we have a loose secondary light source in this scene. So we're going to also on that same overlay layer add in a little little hints of blue into some of the shadows and that will also help give a uniformity to the lighting in this scene. Okay, that's looking pretty good. I'm liking that lighting. Now I want to zoom out here and taking a rough look around the painting, I think the next aspect that needs work is the bow. Because right now, everything that's there is kind of a placeholder. You could really consider that entire bow and really the arrowhead too to just be a placeholder. So first thing I want to do is make the bow look a little less basic. And we're gonna add a little artistic flair to it. I'm thinking a couple of spikes coming out the front. But honestly, I'm thinking now that we can get away with just getting rid of the engravings the bow had before in favor of a more simplistic and smooth wood type look to it. This will have a certain elegance to the design and also give a little bit of breathing room, hopefully to the rather complex character and background. As much as it's a good idea to have a lot of detail in your scene, it can be just as important to the balance of a concept to Find areas to give a little breathing room to some of your details. Places that look maybe a little bit more simplistic to give the eye a place to rest in between the intricacies of your more important focal areas. Now to add a polished look to the wood, it's a pretty simple extra step. We just need to zoom in and have the edges catch a little bit of the light with some sharp highlights. With one side that fades out into a soft light, it will make the bow look like it's got a well-finished, glossy look. At which point, we just need to add in a little bit of a wood texture by painting back and forth with our darker and lighter colors over a general area. I'm aiming for a medium to light chestnut wood for this bow. I just need to make sure, though, that I don't make it too intense because I don't want it to pop too much and I don't want the texture to be the primary element. 
So any texture that I do have is made with a long, smooth grain pattern so that it doesn't look rough and instead looks soft. I am going to still put in a few detailed accent pieces here. For this, I'm thinking little silver metal plates in a couple of locations so that we have an accent to the brown of the bow with some nice metallic silver. And even though it's going to be blurred, I still can't help myself. I've got to add in like a few little details in there that just set it off so nicely, in my opinion. After all, at this point in the painting process, I really don't know how much I'm going to blur the bow. I know I'm going to add in at least a little bit of a blur, but it may only be a soft blur, in which case these details will still be somewhat visible by the end. Now, working on the handle of the bow, the first two things I need to worry about are color and shape, before I even start really worrying too much about texture or material. And my conclusion is that a lighter color handle is not going to work. The biggest problem is that the bow is a nice divider line across the painting, and making the handle lighter colored while the rest of the wood of the bow is darker colored breaks the shape up too much. Having the handle be around the same luminosity as the wood makes it one continuous shape and helps the flow of the painting as a result. Now, as far as material goes, I ended up settling on woven strips of wood, which is not something I've seen on bows. I'm sure there's a bow out there somewhere that uses a handle similar to this, but I ended up stumbling across this while scribbling and ended up loving it, so I went in that direction. To really bring out the depth in these wooden strips, I made sure I zoomed in and made sure each edge caught both the lighting and shading appropriately. But the most important detail with this weave is to go in there and erase out little divots along the edges where the weave would have tiny little gaps and stuff like that. You can see how I'm doing it on screen now. It's an incredibly important step though. Lastly, to wrap up the bow, we just need to take the design that we worked on so hard down on the bottom half and mimic it for the top side. Just now it's from the opposite perspective, given that we're looking up at the design. And I am exceptionally happy with where we're at right now on that. So now before we move on to other aspects of Rosa, I think it would be wise to line up where the string would fall because I don't want the string to obscure her eyes or line up in an objectionable way to any other aspects of the painting. So we're just gonna map that out here and Go ahead and alpha lock it and we'll add in a little bit of highlights, making it dark where necessary and put in a few spots where it really catches the light really strongly. And that will look really beautiful. It'll make the string pop in a pretty way. We can actually go ahead and bump that glow up a little bit too. If we duplicate the layer and turn off alpha lock, we'll turn it to a color dodge blending mode for now. Go up to blur and blur this duplicate of the string without disabling the previous version of it. And now you can see that added a little bit of glow. Let's play with the blending mode a bit. I'm thinking glow dodge is a pretty good choice in this case, and we'll erase out 
the glowing string where we want it to fall into shadow. Now you can see the string now has a handful of spots where it's strongly catching the sunlight and that really sets it off nicely. Next stop, we're going to work on the arrowhead. And the very first thing I'm doing is Google searching what a carved stone arrowhead looks like and also how it's tied to the shaft of the arrow. So I think a good place to start is these rough chiseled chip rock marks all over it. It doesn't necessarily have to be pretty, just rough and catches the light in a few places. The arrowhead itself, I want to feel rugged and worn. And just for the sake of experimentation, I did try to make the shaft of the arrow on the lighter side, and it didn't work. Just like when I made the handle of the bow lighter, it breaks up the shape too much, and it does not look right. And that's fine. It was an experiment, and I'm tossing it to the side just as easily as I came up with it. Instead, for now, let's focus more on getting the lighting correctly and bringing the string from the arrowhead wrapping around that shaft. Next, I'm going to add a little blur to the arrow, but before I do, I have made a backup layer of the arrow in its original state in case I decide to alter the amount of blur I'm using in the future. I still have that original to revert back to. We're going to briefly touch on the rear hair here. I want it to have a more powerful flow to its design and feel directional put some momentum behind her jump, basically. So some of the hair will be flipping around, but we'll, we'll get to painting the hair more detailed later. For now, I'm just worried about adding a little bit of color, a little bit of flow, and lining up a general idea for what the silhouette can look like. If you're following along, just remember long fluid brush strokes for long flowing hair. We'll go ahead up here and try to repaint this arm another time. I don't like it being as vertical as it is. We went over this in a previous video, but it's impossibly posed right now. So we're going to lower that down a little bit. I was thinking that maybe I could get away with lowering it down partially and kind of do a compromise between where the 3D model said the arm should go and where I had had the arm placed from our original sketch. Find like a compromise between the two. I'm going to tell you right now, I was wrong. Bringing it down halfway, it did not work. It, it just didn't. The arm still ended up looking too vertical. Worry not though, because I end up throwing it out and going with the arm at a lower angle anyway, and it looks so much better once I do. That aside, I wasn't sure about that when I started repainting the arm. And when you're not sure about something, Sometimes you just need to commit the time to try it out and paint it. And that's what I was doing here. If only so I could learn what doesn't work and use that knowledge in the back of my head in future paintings, if it ever comes up again. Every little mistake in any artwork can be used to help you learn more about the process. But of course, maybe this painting wasn't the best place for that as uh, at this point in the painting, I'd probably already sunk around 30 hours or 35 hours into this, and I wasn't doing myself any favors by quote-unquote experimenting and wasting more time with ideas that, you know, I was pretty sure w wasn't going to work out. I was, I was just having fun with it. Now on her leading arm, I want the musculature to really show. It's important to how the arm is foreshortened, but I think it would also benefit the design of this character to have some defined musculature. She's outdoors a lot. She's an archer. These all lead to having fairly well-defined muscles. But painting an arm at this sharp of an angle isn't the easiest thing. This is a heavily foreshortened angle, and getting it to all line up requires 
persistence and experience. And I'm not afraid to admit that when it comes to painting detailed muscular anatomy like this, I'm lacking in the experience department. Thankfully for me, I feel like I more than make up for that with persistence. So for me, painting this arm is look up references on Google, paint what I can glean from those, and keep trying different ideas and slight tweaks here and there until it starts looking right. And to learn from the process to use next time. I would highly recommend when you are in this type of situation, and if you're a artist that's learning, you will be, where you are painting something that is outside of your normal wheelhouse. Look up references. Trust me, you're not doing your artwork any favors by going it alone and trying to figure it out yourself. But let's go ahead and move on to the rear arm for the time being. I'm not quite happy with the leading arm quite yet, but it's good enough that it's time to move back to the rear arm and lower it down. At this point, I, I've decided that it raised up halfway, not working. Just lower it down and move on. In fact, I'll go with a design that's almost identical to the 3D model we had worked with earlier. I say almost because the 3D model does struggle with the precision of the anatomy when you're dealing with folded joints like an elbow. And it flattens it off a little bit much. Simple fix, we'll just use Liquify to easily extend that back out. Now, something I did learn during the course of this project, this having been the first time I've painted an archer like this, it's important to notice how the drawstring arm has a full alignment with the direction of the arrow itself. That's very important to the proper posturing of your character. Trust me, I tried it the other way. As you could see, it didn't quite work out well. It didn't look right. But that's fine with me, because hopefully my failed experiment will serve you all well as a good example. Now moving the gauntlet down from the old design, I'm thinking about redesigning this because that gauntlet doesn't really portray a lot of beauty at this kind of sharp angle. So maybe a short, like, wide cuff gauntlet would look a lot better. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh, I like this shape a lot more. Let's let's just dive into this and refine that a lot more. We're talking lighting, stitching, and remember, her head itself should cast a shadow across this gauntlet because our primary light source is on the other side of her head. Okay, um, I think we're in a good position now to go ahead and dive into the face. We had some trouble with it, <laughs> and to say the least, in our previous episodes. But I'm feeling good about this. Let's start with a gentle, soft uplighting, and get rid of the elven ear and just turn it into a normal human ear for now, because it's... The, I feel like the elven ear is kind of throwing my proportions a little bit, so I can always turn the regular human ear into an elven ear at a later step, but having it just be a regular ear at this point will make it easier to line up the proportions. The proportions, by the way, are the bottom of the ear lines up to the bottom of the nose, and the top of the ear lines up like right around just below the eyebrow and the top eyelash, somewhere in that range. You know, I originally wanted the clothing to come all the way up her neck, but I think an open neck with a flared out collar is a much better choice for her.
because at the moment I'm trying to balance out my proportions and also line a bunch of different things up, I'm keeping the facial features on the simpler side for the time being until I start feeling like the face is starting to come together. But I'm also using these more simplistic eyes to play with the expression because I still haven't settled on the exact nature of the expression that I want her to have. So I'm still playing with that design as we're painting here. So that that process is easier, I've kept the eyes and the lips on separate layers so that I can transform and liquefy them both easily without having to worry about the rest of the face getting in the way of that process. And I think we're starting to get there. The expression that we have right now. I'm actually okay with that. So let's go ahead and refine out the lighting a little bit more on this face. And remember to think about the shape of the face and the planes that you can represent that shape with. You should always be thinking about that sort of facial structure while you're mapping out your design. You have the side of the face, you have the cheekbones, you have the cheeks themselves, and of course the forehead. Every one of these parts can be represented as a flat plane in the early steps of lighting the face. If you're looking for a detailed and precise breakdown of the anatomy of the face, might I recommend you go take a look at some of the awesome work from Proco or Aaron Blaze, both of which do some very technical and detailed anatomy breakdowns, which I don't really have the time for to do in this video, but if you're interested, definitely go check them out. I certainly have, on more than one occasion, whenever I feel like I have an anatomy-based problem that's stumping me, I like using them as a good resource. Now, immediately following the importance of the eyes and eyebrows to the emotion of a character are the lips. Now, the lips should be placed around halfway to three quarters of the way up from the bottom of the chin to the bottom of the nose. And on this painting, I want them to have a soft look to them, so I'm going to mostly stick to painting them with soft brushes. Now, if you want to focus more on the structure of the lips, might I suggest thinking about these three shapes here. This method is one of the more common ways of simplifying the basic shape of the lips. Although don't expect it to work in the same way on every set of lips in every emotion. The lips are a very flexible part of the body, and not everyone's lips are the same either. So naturally, any shape you represent them with in a simplified form is going to need to distort as the lips themselves change shape depending on what emotion you're trying to draw. But those three circles are a good place to start in most cases, and even though I don't actually draw them myself, I'm always keeping it in the back of my mind while I'm building up the structure and the depth and shape of the lips. But now that we've really painted in some pretty soft lips, watch this, because it only takes a surprisingly few amount of sharp squiggly brush strokes to properly layer in the highlights of the lips. Now what I'm using here is a hard brush with pressure sensitivity for the opacity and the size of the brush. So it tapers nicely, but most importantly is that I'm using an off-white for the brightest highlights. I'm avoiding using a pure white because that would be too bright and it would provide too much contrast and distract from the rest of the face. Trust me, an off-white is much better for this situation. Next, I'll go ahead and add a little more color to the lips on a multiply blending mode layer and follow it up with a hue and saturation adjustment so we can play with the hue a little bit and the luminosity and find something that looks good and not overpower the color that we have here. 
Okay, me from the future here. For a while here, I was having a very hard time. The face was looking good, but on a personal level, I just was not happy with the direction the structure of the face was going in. So for the next little while, we're going to turn off the eyes and we're going to work on that structure and the shading and keep fiddling with it and poking around until it starts looking better. Right now, we're not too far off from a very good state. Everything just needs to be shifted around a little bit to find the right balance. So without the eyes in the equation, we're really focusing more on the shape of the face and the way the hair is draping down around it. But you can also see I'm trying to avoid getting tunnel visioned into working in on just the face. We're zooming out on a fairly often basis to check the scale of the face and the head overall and changing the size, seeing if the proportions of the head still match that of the body. When the proportions are off, it can make all sorts of different things look wrong. So make sure you're zooming out often to check and double check and even triple check if you're having trouble with it, your proportions. And I cannot stress it enough. Remember to flip your canvas because it's a great way of getting a fresh set of eyes to make sure you're not getting tunnel visioned into not seeing the mistakes that you're actually making. But now that we are finally getting the face into a somewhat good state, placing in the shadows for the area just under the chin and everything's starting to refine out more and her skin is developing a very soft look to the texture. And I think next we're going to dive into repainting the eyes back into this face now. But because our perspective has changed a little bit, I'm going to map out the rough face proportions as if we were sketching it with a circle and some lines. And this time I tried painting the eyes in a slightly different way, opting to paint in the entirety of the eyelashes as a solid silhouette and painting the white of the eyes over it. There ended up being not really that many benefits, but there was no negative to it either. If you wanted to paint your eyes like this, there wasn't any real downside I found to it. And right there, right there, did you see it? I made the eyes a different color. They're now a blue-green, which brings the background into her design. And now the eyes work. The beauty of the eyes can really shine now that the color balances so well with our scene. Now that the eyes are finally on the right path and the face is starting to come together, it's starting to finally show that emotion that I wanted so much from this painting. And it's not an emotion that's particularly intense. She's not furious or distraught or happy. There's just a subtle focus to it. In my opinion, painting a subtle emotion is so much more difficult than painting a more intense one. Because with a subtle emotion, you have to tread a difficult line between only hinting at the emotion you want to show and there not being enough emotion to communicate intent. Or even worse, if the emotion ends up looking like the character is faking it. Because if you don't line up the balance between the eyebrows, the eyes, and the lips just right, it will look like your character is faking the emotion. And of course, that doesn't look right. 
Unless your character faking an emotion, I guess, is what you're going for, then I guess in that case, spot on. But that's not what I'm doing here. I just wanted a subtle focus. These eyes have a focal point that points right past the arrowhead at wherever she's aiming. Honestly, they kind of line up right with the arrowhead and then go right past it. And that's perfect. That's absolutely perfect. I did think about making a little butterfly landing on the end of the arrowhead, and I thought that would have been a good focal point for her to be looking at. But in my mind, I also threw that idea out because it would have been one focal point too many for this painting. It's fine having more accent pieces throughout the image, but you know, I start drawing the line at like four plus focal points and we're already at like three and a half. So pushing in another one would have been a little much. You know, I was so intent on talking about the emotion because well, it's an important topic, but I completely forgot to talk about the ear while we were painting it. And that ear ended up being pretty unique. I don't think it looks very elven. If anything, it looks a little aquatic. But hey, I've said it in our previous episodes. This is an original character. We can do with it what we want. And I like that ear, so I'm keeping it. Notice how up until now, I've kept the luminosity on the face fairly muted. And that is purely so that I can come back in now and drop in a few of these highlights on a new layer and play with the highlights. See where specifically on the face I want them to fall. Now, if you had an idea of where you want your highlights to be from the very get-go, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that is a great place to start if you know what you're doing. But in this particular painting, especially with how much trouble I've had with the face, the subtlety of the accent highlights has not been on the top of my to-do list. That said, with the lighting angle we're dealing with, I've had a fairly generalized idea of what I was going to do with the highlights from the beginning. It's just now I'm ready to actually start implementing slight variations of that. And that is to say, small amounts of dappled, intense highlights scattered across the face with a little bit of Rembrandt lighting. And now that the lighting on the face has started to come together and look really nice, it's about time that I double back to the eyes and touch up their details a little more. I know some of you are probably looking at those and wondering what else could I do to them? Oh, but trust me, we can make them look better. It's just a matter of going in there to the smaller details and asking yourself, or in this case myself, what abstract elements of these eyes could we add some more refinement to. For example, the eyelashes are just kind of a general shape of the eyelashes. But we can take that one step further by painting in individual hair strands. And that's an extra element of detail that wasn't there a minute ago. This is a great opportunity to tighten up the focus on the irises to really make sure they're more lined up with where I want them to be looking. And also, we can touch up the highlights and adjust the lighting and how it reflects off the surface of the eyes. But it doesn't stop there. We can add extra little lines to the skin under the eyes. And we can also touch up the eye shadow to add in a more prevalent gradient across the eye shadow 
making it really dark near the edge of the eye and then fade out to the skin color. My point is that we have so many options to make these eyes look better. And I love every step of it. And some might be quick to point out that wearing makeup in her particular situation of high activity near a waterfall in a hot and stuffy rainforest isn't really the most practical decision. <laughs> but really, to me, it looks good enough to justify the illogic of wearing it in this situation. Critics be damned, I'm adding it. Let's face it, when do I ever let practicality stop me from at least bending the rules to present a little more beauty in a scene? Never. The answer is never. I never let it stop me. The eyeshadow looks good, and it also does a great job at bringing in the hair color into the face a little bit. Now, speaking of the hair, I'm currently in the middle of repainting it. The hair before we had was looked a little stringy and a little wet, which maybe she took a dip in the waterfall or something. But honestly, I want something that's more soft and flowing. So some of these more chaotic strands around the design are going to get repainted into a more smooth and gentle flow. You can see I'm building up these brush strokes one at a time, painting back and forth, and we're building up the texture on a clipping masked layer on our silhouette. And now that the hair has a good texture to it and a good flow, as well as we've now defined some of these hair strands, let's see if we can go back in there and punch up the contrast and make the lighting here a little more dynamic. I'll start with this little reflective dark streak across the upper left area of her hair first. We'll pull in some highlights around it to really sharpen it up and come in with some blending modes to add an extra, like, dash of brightness. I'm thinking Color Dodge would be a good choice. And I'm thinking that if we drop in a solid dynamic shadow here from her hand and ear on the left, on, well, her right side of her face, I think that will look really, really good here. Now, attention to detail here. I didn't have to add in her second ear. It wouldn't have destroyed the painting had I forgotten it. But the fact is that her ears jut out the side of her head and go outward a lot. With that much reach, the ear on the back side of her head would still show some through the hair at this angle. So I felt it important to include a little bit of it and drop in a little bit of subsurface scattering just because the lighting is hitting it that strongly as well. Now through the subtle shifting of the angle and position of the bow, once again, the parts of the midriff that were behind the bow are starting to show. So I'm gonna go ahead and do what I should have done from the very beginning, which is turn the bow layer off and paint the clothing underneath it in full. Like I said, should have done this earlier just because of how much I knew I was going to end up moving the bow, but it's not really wasted effort because we're getting around to it now and that's fine. I'm also gonna go ahead and touch up a little bit of her posturing and her body language. I really want to push the fact that she's got her back arched. And even though it's not really showing behind the bow, it's still a good idea to correct for that body language. Okay, 
I think I'm ready to move on to painting that rear hair now in full this time. So I'm going to start with a multiply layer and kind of paint in some darker shadows around here. And I'm also going to make a color dodge layer and kind of add a little bit of a pink glow to some of the highlights. And the blending modes I'm adding in are just to roughly map in some variety to our luminosity. In fact, I think they made it a little too saturated, so I will end up desaturating it back down to a more reasonable level as we paint it. But now that we've got a good standby for the color, I'm going to go ahead and merge all those layers together. All the blending modes, all those normal layers that I had clipping masked, they're all becoming one again. And I'll go ahead and duplicate that hair layer in its current state so that I'm completely free to play with the design here and still have a backup I could revert to in case I make a boo-boo. But I'm really just going to zip around here and add some more details in a few places and try to clean up the design. Work on the contrast and colors and saturation where I can. Okay, now that the texture of the hair is looking pretty good, I'm going to focus more on extra stray details. So we're going to make another new layer and add in a whole bunch of separate hair strands that just kind of break up that main body pattern here. Just loose strands, we're just gonna go around and that adds in a lot of intricate details very quickly. If we end up adding too many or they end up being too detailed in any particular spot when we zoom out and take a look at it from a distance, it'll be easy enough to go back in and reduce it with an eraser or with some blur tool because we're working on a separate layer right now. And this part becomes pretty simple. We've already mapped in our bigger shapes and our silhouette for the hair at this point. So I just need to pick a spot and start layering in hair strands, smaller, more detailed hair strands. They need to still somewhat follow the same flow as the bigger shapes, but that's just a matter of following along with the pattern that I've already laid out. Now, the amount of smaller hair strands you paint in can vary depending on what your preference is and what your art style you're painting is. For this painting, since she's jumping through the air and there's a lot of motion, the hair's going to have a lot of separation, so I want to paint in a fair amount of additional hair strands going in a lot of different directions. Although I'm still not being chaotic because if I ended up drawing too many sharp angles with them or wiggly wrinkles in the hair, it would start looking wet and messy again and I'm not going for that. So even though we're painting a lot of chaotic strands, they still should have a certain gentle curvature to them. And now I'm thinking that this big curl on the hair that we have down here, I kind of like it, but I want to try something new, something different. So bear with me while I try a little experiment here. 
my concept right now is that she's jumping up into the air and maybe kind of like twisting her body as she jumps. But to really emphasize the fact that there's a little twist going on, I think the hair should have a little twist in it as well. So I'm going to kind of break one of my own rules here in a limited capacity by spiraling the hair down here. It will make it look a little messy and tangled, but it will add some additional emphasis to the angular momentum of this scene. Hopefully. That or it will just look like a knotted mess. Only one way to find out. Either way, I'm giving it 110% of my effort here because I really want to see if I can make this work. But I'll let all of you decide whether or not you think it was a good idea or not. Okay, I'm very happy with the hair right now. Let's move back to working on her body because things are starting to really come together here. And as different elements start to line up and become more of a finished state, it highlights other aspects that we might have overlooked in earlier steps that previously looked like they were in a good state, but now we're starting to really show that they needed just a little more work. For instance, harebrained idea here. What if I kind of give her a crop top? Just chop off the lower part of her outfit, make it so it's pants and a top. It's so important to experiment, especially when you're painting your own character, because you'll never know if an, that idea that you had, even if it was just a completely random thought, might work or might not unless you try it. And okay, I've tried it. This does not work. Get rid of it. After all, this was not a permanent change. I painted it all on new layers and everything so we can easily just undo it and go back. No problem whatsoever. Now, I want to add a little more detail to her clothing. It needs just one more aspect to push it over the top and really make it look beautiful. So let's go ahead and embroider some floral patterns into the white of the cloth around her midriff. Of course, these little areas will need little stitches and everything. Don't have to go over the top in the detail level. Just a little bit will be enough to make it look right. These are very small details after all. We just need to add enough to make them pop and give a gesture of the finer details, even if we don't have to dive into them fully. But speaking of finer details, I... What? Another harebrained idea here. What if we add in a little bit of gold trim as an accent to all this embroidery? We'll have to wait until we get it shaded in properly to really tell if it works, but... I'm kind of liking it as a good starting point for now. I'm not instantly throwing that out. So let's go ahead and go in here and start detailing this gold. Now painting any kind of metallic surface is all about the reflections. Reflecting both the environment around them as well as primarily the light sources around them. But this gold down here doesn't have much in the way of direct light sources from the primary light source. It's mostly the secondary. So we'll catch a lot of upglow from the blue area on the bottom left side of the painting. But I don't want it to just be solid blue everywhere, so I'm going to actually downplay that a little bit. And we'll just go around all these little gold edges and add in just little touches of sharp shine in a brighter gold color, and that should give the edges a nice pop to them. Oh, ooh, ooh, okay, ooh, I'm on a roll here. Uh, the green crystal that is on her chest piece of the gold right now, that's kind of just off on its own. There is no 
other element of this painting yet that really pulls that in and makes that feel set. It's just by itself. So what if we take these undetailed plates of gold that are just below her chest line and embed two emeralds in them and really make them feel set there. Now we have a rule of threes. We have three emeralds spread around her outfit and that works. That works. I like that. We just need to detail them now. And we're just gonna go around here and finish this gold off, I think. It's just a matter of taking what we did on the lower side of painting all the little edges with sharper highlights and capturing little shadows everywhere and pushing the lighting onto the surface of the gold, both in the form of reflections and the form of shadows cast across the sides. As we can see now on the upper chest, we do have just a smidge of the primary light source coming in across the gold. And I want this to somewhat feel like it's coming in through the hair. Once again, technically, I think the head would be blocking this particular angle. But now that it's there, I actually really love this specific highlight, so I'm not getting rid of it. It looks good enough that I'm keeping it, even if it's not quite realistic. While we're here working on the upper chest, let's just go ahead and touch up the hair. The hair that's coming off the top of her head needs some more details and we need to paint some of these hair strands coming up over the arm. Because of the way our layers were ordered, the leading arm is actually on top of the hair layer. So I'll make another hair layer above that arm and just paint in some hair on top of it. Now the arm itself actually needs to have its lighting rebalanced as well, because now we've kind of mapped in the good look for the hair, we need to put the lighting in on the arm. So that means a lot of this arm up near the shoulder is actually going to fall into the shadows unlike it was before. Speaking of lighting, it will be really beautiful if we come in here right where her hair is coming down over her shoulder and dapple in a few really bright highlights on the skin of her shoulder that creep through the hair. It's the little elements like that from your lighting. When one element casts a shadow or an occlusion causes a highlight in a specific shape that brings the depth of your image truly out. In a two-dimensional painting, it really is one of the best ways to describe the spacing in a scene in a three-dimensional way. And if you're always looking for little things like that to make the depth of your image show, you'll be bringing your painting skills to a whole other level. And the better you can do it, the more pleased you'll be with the results.
Now continuing our path here, moving past the leading arm, let's go to the hand that's holding the bow. This should be gloved. Because the rear arm is gloved, there's no real reason I can think of that the other arm shouldn't be gloved as well. I'm not giving her just one glove in this case. So let's just quickly use some adjustments to just take the hand and recolor it. Simple enough. And we're just color matching right now. We're just trying to get the color from the rear glove to match on this glove too. But we're also design matching and we're gonna go in here and we're gonna add in these same little gold tipped fingers. Notice that I am leaving off the gold tips for the fingers on the thumb and the index finger because those would need a little bit more grip. The metal accent is really just on the pinky, the ring finger, and the middle finger. That way she can still grasp things without just grabbing with metal, which would be difficult. So pointer finger and thumb, they're being left as just gloved fingers. Now we're going to make another new layer behind the bow and behind the glove. And we're going to make the rear side of the gauntlet kind of flare out just like the other one, but now at a different perspective. And remember, we're matching design. This needs to look like a matching glove. So all the same details that are painted on the other one get painted here on this one as well, just at a different perspective. Okay, everything's really coming together here. I mean, zooming out here, Spotting something that still needs work isn't as easy as it was just a little while ago, which is a great sign. It means everything's finally starting to come together. But there is one thing here that is definitely catching my eye. Uh, oh, actually two things. Okay, we need to add the little rings on the glove to the other glove. But assuming we'll paint that in just a minute, I want you to take a look at her clothing design and divide her in half horizontally, her upper body, and her lower body. Now, look at the color of red we're using. See the problem? The upper body is using a different shade of red than the pants. Now, this is not the type of hue variation that I've talked about. This just makes it look like the top and bottom halves of her clothing don't match. So we have the option of either making all of the kind of more purplish red on the top side of the body, more of a red red, like the pants, or the opposite, make everything on the lower body more of a purplish red. Okay, now having tried that out with just a rough overlay layer that we just threw in to test it, I've come to the conclusion we need to make the red from the pants spread upward rather than the purple go downward. The more red red just looks better. It just does. The purple red that we had on the upper body just looks muddied once you spread it to the pants. So no on that. Just going with red red. And we're going to use the same trick that we actually did on the uh, just the temporary layer. We're just going to make an overlay layer and we're just going to pay a little bit more attention to how we paint it. Just kind of softly with a soft brush paint in kind of a red, and that should shift the color just enough. There you have it. Now we'll just go down the layers and duplicate and merge that layer as necessary to each independent layer of the clothing on the upper body that needs to shift its color. Since that one overlay layer kind of just covered them all, now we need to merge it into each one individually. But that's fine, that just takes a minute here.
Now the blur that the background has, I think could use a little more, a little more blur in a few areas, but I like it being this amount of blur in others. So we're just going to make a duplicate of this background layer and we're going to blur it more and then we're going to mask it out so that we can specifically control that some of the background is extremely blurry and some of the background will only be slightly blurry. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, looking back at the sketch, there's an element of this painting that I should definitely include that I kind of forgot to. Just slipped my mind. I had originally a light, lightly threaded like tiara type crown type headdress piece around around the top of her head. And I have yet to add that. I, I, it, it slipped my mind. I'll, I'll say it now. It slipped my mind. <laughs> Didn't even remember it until just just now when referencing the sketch. Okay, let's go in there and just paint it. Now here's a trick to painting these loosely threaded jewelry type things. Just sketch in a rough design with a solid brush that is only pressure sensitivity to the size of the brush, but not the opacity of the brush. And just dot in a loosely threaded stitch of shapes. Real quickly, I'll get back to that. Let's paint some leaves over here. Thought just occurred to me and I don't want to forget it. We're going to paint some green leaves on the side of this head jewelry because I think that would look good. No other reason. This just now occurred to me, but I think that would look good. Okay. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Now that we've loosely sketched out a design, we're going to zoom in. And I was very, very loose in the initial sketch for this piece of jewelry. And that way, now I can take what was random brush strokes and interpret it into a unique design. And as we go around, I'm just going to take each one of these spots and make them feel more intentional. Connect all these shapes and also put in the shine and make it look more metallic. And you'll notice even just a little bit of this is making it pop. It does not take much to take just a random assembly of sharp shapes that are roughly in a metallic, or in this case, gold color and make them look like a real piece of jewelry. The other thing is that I am keeping a symmetrical design here. So any random brush strokes that happened on the left side or the right side, I'm going to mirror them on the opposite side, at least loosely. That way the finished product looks intentional. I'm just going with a squared off diamond shape here with four flat planes to the jewel and I'll have the light catch on one side. Pretty simplified design, not overly complicated in its three-dimensional structure. And these little jewels, I'll touch them up too. Okay, now I think that the red of her pants and the gloves at this point, which are, the th are good focal points, needs to be brought up into this a little bit. So if we paint a red flower, kind of a rose almost from the backside though, on the other side of these green leaves, it should look really good. And now zooming out and turning back on the foreground tree limbs that we had from before. Uh, this completely obscures that little, those little leaves in the flower. So we need to move this tree limb more to the sides to balance it better so that we can see what we just painted because that it really is a nice little accent piece to the top of her head. It would be a shame to cover it up with just a blurry tree limb. And while we're here working on the foreground, let's go ahead and add in those blue butterflies into the foreground. Right now, the only ones we have are really, really blurry and they're really set into the background as well. I want some that are on their own layer, separate from everything else that I can control the blur for and move around independently. Plus these will have more detail in them and I'll have more control over how much they glow and how much they're presented in the scene. Although I still don't want them to steal focus from any of our focal points. They're purely an accent to the scene. Really, they serve a solid purpose here, but it's mostly to bring the blue in from the bottom right of the water up into the rest of the scene and to dabble it in in a few other places. 
So if we just move them around here and just keep moving them around until we found something that balances well, I'll just keep playing with it. And I think that looks good. Let's move on to final lighting. We're gonna start this with a multiply layer like I so often do on final lighting and paint bucket in a general shadow color, which generally means somewhere in the blue spectrum. And we're going to mask it. And now in that mask, we are going to paint out where we want the primary parts of our lighting to fall. In fact, here's an extra step you can take. If we go to our character layers, we can control click our character layers and that will give us a selection around everything that is our character. And we can use that selection as a way to help us erase out the mask on that multiply layer. It's an extremely handy trick to be able to bring light to things like the hair strands that on a multiply layer like that would be difficult to go in there and fine tune detail in the mask following each and every hair strand. Much easier to just form a selection around all of them at once and just softly brush the mask away on the multiply layer once again to make those hair strands brighter by erasing the shadows. Next for final lighting, I'm gonna drop in a color dodge layer here and we're gonna start adding in a little bit of yellow, orange, kind of warm glow. And we'll also get a little bit of blue and add in a little bit of blue glow to the secondary light source side of the image. So anywhere that has a strong, a strong shape to support up lighting, I'll put a little bit of blue on and anywhere that supports a strong shape for down lighting, I'll cast a little bit of like yellowish orange on. Now that we've done that, let's add a screen layer on. This will help add a little bit of atmospheric haze on top of our character this time. But I still want to add in a few more details to the lighting behind our character. So don't feel the need to make every final lighting layer above the character. Some of them will belong behind the character. Right here, we're using an add glow layer to add in some sharp light streaks behind Rose of Vincast. That's perfectly acceptable. In fact, these are extremely strong, so we're going to blur them significantly and kind of erase them out some as well. They only need to kind of hint at the details. Also, they're all coming in perfectly parallel, which doesn't lend itself to perspective. So if we transform them, we can actually skew them a bit and distort them so that they have a little bit of spread to their angle. Now we'll make another add glow layer, put it above everything else once again. Well, all of our mid-ground elements. We're still keeping all of these blending mode layers behind our foreground elements. We don't want them catching this lighting, but in add glow layer, and we're going to really brighten up some spots around her, like head and like chest, and maybe a little bit on the shoulder too. Perfect. Next, and this one's an important one, although it is a small detail. Let's add some atmospheric dust to the scene. What causes atmospheric haze is small particulates in the air. Now, not all of those are necessarily tiny. So we need to represent a couple of them, specifically showing more dominantly where the light catches on them, but it needs to be downplayed so that it doesn't overwhelm the scene. And that balance can be difficult to strike on some paintings, like I'm having a little trouble with it here. But just keep playing with it. And if the dust you're painting looks a little on the sharp side, don't hesitate to break out the blur tool and smudge them a little bit. Okay, looking good. Next, I'm going to paint this on normal layer so that you can see what I'm doing before I change it to a blending mode. But we're adding in some yellows up near our light source 
and some blues near the bottom of the image and kind of blending in some general pretty colors around as well, some purples and mixing up the hue quite a bit and also adding in some brilliantly colored light streaks. And we're gonna change that to an overlay layer. And now we're gonna just turn that layer off because it's a little powerful and I don't want it distracting from everything else we're doing. Looking at this again, I think we need a little bit more atmospheric dust. I think I'm going to try a slightly different approach to this. Some more medium sized ones rather than the super large ones in the foreground maybe. And we'll blur them, of course, because they're in the foreground. I'm just going to keep trying and attempting this atmospheric dust until it looks good. Remember to vary the size of your brush on a regular basis when dealing with this sort of thing so that dust particles are of all different sizes and don't all look uniform. Okay. Now let's go ahead and make an add glow layer here. And we're just going to go around the character, specifically her outer edges. And we're going to touch up all the edges with just a smidge of rim lighting here. Eh, who am I kidding? I'm not just going to go around the outer edges. I also want to touch up a little bit of the shine on the gold too. Anything that needs just a tad more shine to it or rim lighting to it. Let's hit a little bit with this. Even the blurry bow in the front can get a little bit of this as long as we blur it after we've painted it in. I'm also making sure to shift my color around as we get lower and lower down into the painting, closer to our secondary light source. I'm changing the color to be more blue so that it doesn't conflict with that secondary light source color. I would hate for it to look out of place. But this is just a matter of patience. We just have to go around every important line of her figure and catch a little bit of light on it. And I'm also, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of doubling this layer also to touch up the gold too because Add Glow is a great layer to give a little extra punch to the shine of gold and other metallic surfaces. Oh, you know what? Let's add a little bit of sprinkled in shine on the bowstring as well. I think that's good. I varied my pressure quite a bit so it sparkles on the bowstring rather than being a solid line. Keep that in mind. Now let's go back to our layers and turn that overlay layer back on because we're getting really close to the end here and I do like that layer. But I do think I wanna play with the colors just a bit. So let's change its opacity around bring up a hue and sat, play with the design a little bit. I'm thinking somewhere like 20, 23%, somewhere in that range for opacity is a good place for it. Now, if we look here and zoom in, we've got some great detail around from atmospheric particles to just details in the clothing. Everything is looking really great on this painting. I'm loving all the details. If we look a little bit closer though, we can see we've got some great detail and atmospheric over here, but mainly like everywhere else, it's like super ultra clear. And there's one little trick I want to show you here. If we make a new layer, go up to filter, then we'll go down to render and then uh, go to the noise. Just add in noise. Uh, we should probably zoom out first. So let's zoom out first. Double click the hand to zoom out. And now we will go down to render and add the noise. Let's down the scale of that noise. We're just trying to get a uh, kind of photo noise here. So it can be very small and still be fine. Let's see what the different scalers do here. I'm just going to experiment with all of these, see what they do. And best way to see what something does is to <laughs> throw the scalers to the extremes. Okay, it looks like that's like sharpness maybe. Let's up the scale so we can see more of what this is doing. Okay, so it's upping the contrast. 
Mm, those are just offsets, so we're good to go. That looks like photo noise. Now we'll press OK. And now, uh, look at our glorious painting. <laughs> no, of course not. We're just going to go up here and thumb through the blending modes here and see which one works the best for our desired outcome. We're just trying to get a little bit of texture added. We'll probably end up with something like overlay, but don't know yet. Naturally, whichever one we go with, we're going to down the opacity like way down. Yep, overlay does look the best. You can see how it's added a lot of texture without actually doing much to the painting. So, so far overlays the, ooh, soft light's not bad. It took a little bit of the intensity away that overlay was adding, so soft light's now our preferred option. Hard light, new. Difference, no. <laughs> Vivid light, no. I'm pretty sure we're gonna stick on soft light. Pin lights just turned it into dust particles. Hard light, hard mix rather. Exclusion, new, new. No, no, definitely not. Although it is nice to take a peek at the painting in black and white. It's looking pretty good. Okay, so we, we decided that soft light was the best option here. Now we're gonna down the opacity, like I said, way down. We're gonna zoom in now and see how that texture looks. It's a little bit big and not sharp enough. It needs to be a little bit sharper. So here's what we're gonna do. Now that we know that we want soft light, we can now experiment with this. So we're gonna delete that version of the layer and we're gonna make another new layer in its place. This time we're going to go ahead and change it to soft light right off the bat. And now we're going to go up to add the noise, turn its scale all the way down. Yeah, that's looking pretty good at just the smallest scale. Amplitude all the way up, and amplitude all the way down. Let's settle somewhere, yeah, that looks good. It adds in just a little bit of like photo texture. And that's what we're looking for, just a smidge of photo texture. Not enough that it would bother anybody, but enough that if you zoom in, you're able to see it and it adds definition. Although if you're not looking for it, it's incredibly easy to overlook. That's roughly the balance we're going for here. Man, I think that's pretty good. Off looks a little bit too smooth. Everything's a little bit untextured. On, it's just enough. Okay. And when zoomed out, it doesn't really do much at all. You have to zoom in to about that level to even start to see it. Now, did we want the painting flipped to the left or the right for the final version? Tough decision. Honestly, I'm, I'm fine with either. We've kept this painting balanced in both directions throughout the whole process. So it's kind of hard to determine which direction would be better. This will do for now. Let's go ahead and make another new layer. We're just gonna go ahead and join me in, zoomed in here. Where do we want to sign this painting? Down here, why not? Now, what should we name the character? I always name my character underneath the line. Well, let's bring up an internet asset I like to use for coming up with names here. Behindthename.com. It's pretty useful for just poking around and finding useful names. You get lots of nice categories. Well, you know, none of these names are actually jumping off the page at me is perfect for her. So why don't we go do another trick here? We're going to go to Google Translate. Uh, what would be a good language for this name to be in? Mm, let's try Norwegian. Let's just come up with two words that subtly describe our character here. Uh, <laughs> Whispering Death. There you go, there's her name. Hesvigindedod. <laughs> Close enough. Jokes aside. Whispering death doesn't quite fit her well. <laughs> uh, piercing Willow, maybe? I'm just trying to spitball here some names. What would, what's pink in Rosa? Hmm? Okay, well, let's take. Let's do Gust. Ooh, Vincast actually is a pretty nice Gust is definitely a more powerful sounding type of wind than just wind. And uh, Vindkast is, let's see if I'm pronouncing that right. Vindkast, Vindkast. Pretty close enough. So Vindkast. 
Vindcast, and so Pink Gust, Rosa Vindcast. Not a bad name. Okay, Rosa Vindcast. I like the name. We'll just go down here and I'll write in with my absolutely horrible handwriting her name. Okay, well, this might take a while. Give me a minute here. Okay, well, that took entirely too much time, but I'm happy with it. Looks awesome. And I think that does it. Wow. Well, this has been a fun and rewarding painting project. Like seriously, when we set out, my goal was to walk you through my painting process without shying away from the mistakes, instead aiming to treat them as teachable moments. And I feel like we did pretty good on that. While it has been so much work, I'm truly thrilled to know that so many of you have found value in this series. And I certainly hope that it has proven useful. I want to say thank you to everyone who took the time to watch and learn with me throughout this process. Your encouragement and engagement means the world to me. If you have any questions about the process or just wanna say hi, please do not hesitate to drop a comment down below. I read it all and do my best to respond to everything. As for what's next, I haven't really decided yet, but I'll let you all know in a community post when I've got some ideas down. Going forward in the future, I'll likely continue making more Midnight Sketches episodes since that was so well received, followed by speed paints of the rest of the painting process. However, it may be some time before I embark on another full painting process like this again. It's not that I hated the work. In fact, I actually really enjoyed myself. It's just that between the editing, scripting, and recording, there was a lot of it for just one painting at the end of the day, even if we really broke it down in depth. But I would be lying if I didn't say that I was looking forward to getting back to some more regular paintings, like some fan arts, some speed paints, a little bit easier stuff. And I'm looking to make Midnight Sketches a part of that, a regular part of that. In the meantime, I want to know, what part of this painting did you enjoy the most? Is it the fantasy setting, the way I handled atmosphere, the intricacies of the face and hair, or maybe you just like her shoes. They did turn out pretty good, didn't they? <laughs> we struggled with them for a while there, but I'm pretty happy with them. I think the concept balance just turned out immaculate in this painting. I love the way the contrast just makes our character pop off the screen and the focal points just capture the imagination so vividly. And I just think that turned out really good, but I wanna know what you think. So let me know down below in the comments. If you missed any of the parts of this painting series and you're looking to go back and catch up, look no further than this playlist right here. As soon as it appears on the end screen, you know how these things are. And I'll also go ahead and put a link down in the description to that as well. It has been an incredibly informative journey. And if you're looking to learn more about what goes into making beautiful artwork, you will find it all in there. Now, if you enjoyed this painting series, which I hope you did if you watched all the way through to the end of this long video, don't forget to like and share and subscribe if you wanna see more. But that is going to be the conclusion of this project. Thank you again so much for joining me here. I hope you have a wonderful day or night, wherever you are, and I look forward to seeing you all next time.